So reading from a New King James Version, Daniel 1, sorry, Daniel 6, verses 1 to 5, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom one, sorry, 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to set in him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Amen. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're well. I'm just going to uh, open up in prayer. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. And Father God, thank you that we can um, learn the truth in your word this afternoon. And Father God, I just commit myself and everyone uh, listening under the sound of my voice. I pray you'll speak through me, Holy Spirit. And then the word that is preached this afternoon will go on good soil. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I hope you can hear me and see my screen okay. Okay, so um, I'm sure we all enjoyed um, the word from Milton uh, last week. If you did, maybe give him another round of applause, thumbs up. I've actually uh, given Milton a new nickname. I call him the Professor. Milton the professor and he, he preached an amazing word last week and, and um, if I could summarize it in, in a part sentence was reminding us that we are adopted into the family of Christ and I actually took the liberty of adding a sentence which um, provides a perfect gateway into what I want to talk about this afternoon and that is we are adopted into the family of Christ to be used for his glory adopted into the family of Christ to be used for God's glory and uh, when we say um, God's glory, what is the glory of God? It's quite a um, complex uh, uh, word to describe. But if I was to try and encapsulate it in a sentence, the glory of God is the, the beauty of God being made manifest. So the beauty of God that is put on display or the greatness of God that is put on display. So when we say that we're being used for God's glory, it's God's beauty or God's greatness being exemplified in and through us. So much so that um, when, we, when we see um, God's glory um, being put on display and we say that we glorify God, it's to give praise and honour to an extreme degree. And the challenge for us this afternoon, which I want to talk about, is when we say that we're glorifying God, we're saying that actually when people see our lives and they see our conduct and how we are they're able to look at how we are and say yes uh, we give glory to God for what God is doing through that person if there was a golden text for this afternoon it's a or like a memory verse I'll say it's Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 and it says let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your father <clears throat> in heaven and there's two things that stuck out to me uh, in this verse and the first thing is um, that the need to be visible let your light so shine so the need to be visible and this notion that we should be undercover or secret agent Christians doesn't quite line up with uh, God's intention for the kingdom uh, and there is a need for us to, to, to make sure that we're visible and even as a community, not just being um, insular, but actually um, being open and being a light. And, and then the second thing was, um, let your light so shine. And so in other words, it was saying, let your light shine in such a way that, and there was a, almost a standard and a cause and effect that we're supposed to shine in such a way, it says that when uh, they, men, being your, see your good works, they will glorify your Father in heaven. So the standard is, and the standard that is setting the scene for this afternoon is, 
people will see my character. They'll see Tunde's character. They'll see Tunde's conduct. They'll see my level of integrity. And they will look and see um, all of these things and these attributes. And they'll say, truly, the God that Tunde serves is truly the one and true living God. And that's the standard this afternoon, that we're to glorify God through our works and through living a life of excellence, that people will see it and truly testify of the goodness of our God in heaven. Glorifying God with a spirit of excellence. We're going to see the, uh, through the story of Daniel, through really the whole book of Daniel. I'm going to sort of summarize some of the things in the first six chapters of Daniel. And we're actually going to see that through, through the story of Daniel, it, it doesn't really matter when we're talking about uh, um, excelling through excellence. It doesn't matter where we're placed, who's in charge, uh, what people may try to orchestrate. God will get his glory anyway. And he wants to do so through you. And one thing I want to get home is that God has gifted each and every one of us with gifts, talents and abilities. And God wants to shine his glory through each and every one of us, not just select individuals and uh, uh, we shouldn't just be hero worship people in church. God's gifted you with an ability and he wants to shine and get his glory through you. So I'm going to start off with uh, Babylon. And I'm going to explain myself. In Daniel chapter 1, we see that um, the, the children of Israel were actually um, taken siege by um, King Nebuchadnezzar. And when we read the early chapters, we see that um, Daniel, the children of Israel, they were taken siege due to their disobedience. Um, you'll read in Daniel chapter 1. And so it meant that they were taken from their place in Jerusalem and they were transported to Babylon. When we talk of Babylon, I know people that like history, I'm sure Korean but will know, when you talk about uh, Babylon, you're talking about a, a systemic uh, empire of oppression. And even, I know the Rastafarians will refer to Babylon and, and they say Babylon, um, when they talk about oppression, uh, um, and, and it could be um, any, any system, whether it's the, the policies or, or like the police, um, it's a system, systematic oppression. And even in the Bible, even in Babylon, Babylon was uh, an empire and it was known for its evil and corrupt leaders. The, the, the leaders and the kings were very evil, very corrupt. The, the lifestyle was very pagan uh, and they served a whole lot of other gods. And so for, for uh, God-fearing uh, Jews at the time who were in Jerusalem to be catapulted to Babylon, you can imagine it must have been quite a challenge to, to, to be in a place where you're, you're, you're God-fearing and then you're placed in an environment that is anti-God. And I want to ask us the question that what, what might be your Babylon? And for some of us, our Babylons could be our, our working environment, that uh, we're God-fearing people, but we're, we're in an environment where uh, the, the God is money and the God is uh, success. And uh, we wonder to ourselves, what, what am I doing here? Um, is this the right place for me? For some of us, uh, our Babylon could be, you know, we, we might be teachers and, and, and we're God-fearing and we've been placed in a position where uh, our agenda is to really uh, get uh, the children and, and really teach them and set a bright future for them. But fortunately, uh, there's been a set agenda for which is not really uh, the agenda that we really want to teach our children but you're placed in a, you feel you're placed in a compromised position you might even be a place where you're you're a nurse <laughs> and as we can see what's all going on with the pandemic and you can see that there's uh, systems and ways that you perhaps don't even agree with and vaccines that you've been told you may have to vaccinate people with and you're like i don't feel that perhaps i may not belong here and so I want to challenge us this afternoon, as we'll see from uh, the book of Daniel, that actually God may have placed you in your Babylon and God may, through his uh, providence, his divine providence, he may have you exactly right where he wants you. And right there in your Babylon, that place of oppression, 
those environments that seem evil, those lifestyles that are pagan. God is using you in a, such a mighty way where he can get his glory. And we're going to look at what it means to be in exile, to be in places that we don't feel comfortable, to be in places where we feel uh, that we don't fit in and we don't belong, to be in environments that are anti-Christ, but to still be able to exhale. So to be in exile, but still able to exhale. So as Kareem read, and, and I'm going to uh, read it again, we'll see um, verses uh, three to four. It says, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some faults in the way Daniel was handling the government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn because he was faithful always responsible and completely trustworthy. And I really want to highlight um, those attributes that they saw in Daniel. And we're actually going to see a sort of cause and effect that actually um, for them to see that Daniel was faithful, he was always responsible and completely trustworthy. There must have been some other underlying characteristics um, of Daniel with the spirit of God working in and through him that people saw and it made sure that Daniel was blameless. And it's those characteristics I want to go for us this afternoon. What was Daniel doing that people who were his enemies looked at him and said, nothing you can say against this guy, you know? He's faithful, he's always responsible, and he's completely trustworthy. And we'll see some of these, we're going to go through these. Um, Daniel's committed, he's consistent, he was calm, and he was connected. And so the first thing was Daniel, Daniel made a level of commitment. Um, we see that in Daniel chapter 1, um, verse 8. It said Daniel purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to eat the king's food. And I think more than just Daniel watching his diet, um, Daniel purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself. And Daniel set himself a standard to say, although I'm in Babylon, I'm not going to succumb to the culture. And the, and the ways of Babylon, but I'm in it, but I'm not of it. But it says that he purposed in his heart, so he made a heart decision that he wasn't going to do it. And for some of us, again, being in our Babylon, being in the environments that are not godly, we're going to have to make some heart's decisions. For example, I may work in a working environment that, again, is not, is not godly, but I have to purpose in my heart that I'm not going to uh, I succumb to the gutty. I have the purpose in my heart that I made a commitment that I'm married. And so whatever happens in the pub and what happens late at night, uh, I have the purpose in my heart. I'm not going to succumb to some of the practices and behaviors that happen in a workplace. Sometimes some of us are going to have to purpose in our heart, whether we're the only Christian in our family. Some of us are going to have the purpose that we're going to choose to love our siblings and our loved ones, even though they do things that may um, rub us the wrong way. But we're making a commitment in our heart that we're always going to choose godly principles or purpose in our heart that we're always going to choose to serve God uh, and serve him wholeheartedly. And so the first thing was that Daniel made commitments in his heart. Secondly, Daniel was um, consistent. We see in Daniel chapter 6, verse 8, uh, verse 10, sorry, when Daniel went to pray. So when Daniel actually learned that um, his fellow colleagues were um, conspiring against him and he realized that actually there was a law that was set that said that anyone who prays to any other God um, was going to be thrown into the den of lions. It says that Daniel simply went up to his upper room and prayed just as he always would do. And there was something about Daniel's consistency and his discipline that set him apart from the rest. And there was a fantastic um, quote that I've, I've heard and I've always, it's always stuck with me. And uh, when we look at people who, who, who are disciplined or who are masters of their craft, there's, there's a saying that says, um, people who are masters of their craft, to an amateur, they will call it genius. But to the person who masters their craft, they simply call it practice 
I'll say that again. So for someone who masters their craft, uh, the person who, who wants to remain an amateur will, will call it, oh, genius. But for the person who masters their craft, they call it discipline or practice. And I want to bring that into the context of our spiritual growth and development. That perhaps we need to come out of this notion that uh, we're always looking at other people and other people's spiritual growth and maturity and hero worshiping other people's spiritual gifts. And, and it's good to compliment people, don't get me wrong. But what has God put inside of you? And the difference between, uh, you know, God placing gifts and, the, and you carrying the anointing is spiritual discipline. It's going to be what happens behind closed doors. So for an athlete, for example, if you look at a Usain Bolt or you look at a Michael Jordan or you look at a Lionel Messi uh, or Serena Williams, who's great at tennis, they've been gifted with the ability to play these, whether it's tennis or the ability of athletics or football or basketball. But spend a week with them and see their discipline. Spend a week with them or a day with them and see their routine. What sets them apart is the discipline that when everyone is sleeping or when everyone is deciding that they stop practicing, they continue. And it's like that with our spiritual growth. We have to make conscious decisions to be disciplined and consistent. So we have to make life choices sometimes that on the weekend, is it Netflix or is it I'm going to spend two hours in the Word? Is it when we wake up in the morning or when we've got time in our day, it's going to be consistent prayer that whatever situations, whether things are going well, whether things are going uh, uh, not so well, I'm still going to take the time out to pray because I really want to connect with God and I want to be consistent in my spiritual discipline. So I believe that Daniel was set apart because of his spiritual discipline. And for, really, uh, for God's glory to shine in and through us, we're going to have to encapsulate and really stick to spiritual discipline to set ourselves apart. Uh, thirdly, he was calm. Daniel had a calm about him. We see uh, when you read chapter two, um, King Nebuchadnezzar was extremely angry and he probably had bipolar. Um, he was up and down, uh, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he was angry because the people and the uh, astrologers who were supposed to um, interpret his dreams were not coming out with the gods. And so he sent a message for all the people who were supposed to interpret dreams to be killed unless he gets an answer. And we see even throughout the book of Daniel that Daniel um, had wisdom and discretion. And it says that Daniel was able to use wisdom and discretion that kept the, um, the, the, the king's henchmen at bay. And it meant that it bought him more time. Um, and there's something about using wisdom uh, and discretion that's also going to set us apart. That when we see situations that are, are, are puffed up and when we see situations that are going to make us angry, um, the Spirit of God gives us a calm, gives us wisdom. And it's a gift that truly can only truly come from God. That excellence comes with a calm. That's not puffed up, that's not proud. That gives us um, that edge that when we go through situations, situations seem um, difficult that we go to our knees and we hear God's voice in the calm. And it's in that calm that we hear the sweet, small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And uh, it goes to show even in that, um, even in that chapter, um, Daniel got on his knees and God did give him the interpretation of the dream. And lastly, we see that Daniel stayed connected. And so all throughout the book of Daniel, Daniel is a, is a and uh, I'm still going through it uh, and learning so much in the book of Daniel about how Daniel had an active and audacious prayer life. Um, I mean, Daniel, uh, again, he was disciplined, but he, he, he prayed all different types of prayer. Um, he prayed intercessory prayers on behalf of his nation, on behalf of his people. Um, he spoke to God and asked God for sign and counsel. Um, he asked God for mercy. He, he repented when he prayed and he didn't forget to praise God also uh, through his prayer life. If there was ever a fantastic example of someone who had a fantastic prayer life, um, look no further than Daniel. And it really challenged me um, looking at some of the um, things Daniel prayed about. You know, I, I'm good at perhaps praising God when things go well. Yep, I'll praise God. And when I've done wrong, I'm on my knees and repenting. But I had to challenge myself and said, yeah, what about intercessory prayer, Tundee? 
and, and how much does the Spirit of God place in your heart to pray for other people? So I may have complaints about my, my workplace and I may lament to other people about working, but, but how much do I pray for the success of my company or for, for my leaders in my organisation? How much do we pray for uh, our nation, our nation's leaders? And how much do we actually pray on behalf of the, 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 the nation and perhaps the sin of the nation or, or the youth? And it really um, challenged me to really um, connect to God in a much deeper way and a broader way. That I'm not just praying for my own checklist, but Daniel prayed, uh, the Spirit of God laid on his heart to pray for nations, to pray for people, to pray for mercy, to seek God for counsel, for answers, and wait to hear God for answers. And again, when we're talking about excellence, these are the things that set Daniel apart, that actually, God, you're more than just a God of um, hear my cry, O Lord, and thank you for answering. But you want to hear me answer that intercession. You want to hear me ask you for answers and we to hear for the answers. And so we see being connected for God and the whole um, aspect of Daniel's life that really set him apart was underpinned by prayer. So for the people that, that are, are prayer warriors, we, we, we bless you. Um, and, and the people that bang on about prayer, yes, we bless you and we thank you. And, and there's, a, there's an aspect of all of us that can really connect in a deeper way and improve on our, our prayer lives. And, and, and I count myself top of that list. So we see some of these characteristics through the whole book of Daniel. But it's interesting when we look at these characteristics, and, and, and it's a fair retort to say, but um, even though Daniel was committed, even though he was um, consistent, even though he remained calm, even though he was connected to God in prayer, he was still thrown into the so God what is all that about and it's true Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and we see even through the book of Daniel that so was Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace and there's going to be times when our integrity is going to be tested and and it's probably fair to say when we do uh, when we look at the example of Daniel that when we are shining and we people can see the favor of God in our lives, there are going to be people who are challenged with it. And their agenda is going to perhaps try to pull you down. And it's quite interesting, um, on Friday, uh, we had small group and Jason um, led our small group. And he was talking about what it is to be certain in times of uncertainty. And uh, he took us through a number of verses. And one of the powerful things which he did, he got us uh, all to think about a, ver a verse of scripture that's really encouraged us through this difficult time of a pandemic when uh, things seem so uncertain and, and we're not sure about what's going to happen. And we're questioning God and saying, God, what is exactly going on? One of the verses um, that came up, which I'm going to share, was Isaiah 41.10, where it said, and some of us may feel like we're in a den of lions right now, but the book of Isaiah encourages us. It says, uh, Isaiah 41.10, it says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And uh, that verse was so um, um, poignant for me because even reading through the book of Daniel, I can only imagine that um, uh, such, a, such a verse would have been such an encouragement to him, uh, knowing that he had done all he can um, with following God, but yet he found himself in the, in the mouth of the lion's den. But the reality is that even though he was in the, the, the foot of the mouth of the lions, uh, he wasn't harmed. And truly, God is with us even through the toughest of times when we feel like we've been thrown to the lions, when our integrity has been put into question and people um, are trying to discredit your character. God says, do not be discouraged for I am your and I will strengthen you and I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And that goes to show if God has placed you in a Babylon, if God has placed you in a position of discomfort, where um, it's at odds, you feel at odds with your faith or um, the environment is not conducive and you're always wary about what other people are doing, know that God's put you there for a reason and he'll never leave you hanging. And it says that God is gonna strengthen you and help you. So even in those times when you're feeling like it's despair, 
understand that God knows because he's put you there and he will hold you up with his victorious right hand. It's ironic that um, Daniel's name actually means that God is my judge. And um, when, when we look at this, a lot of people use this term, oh, only God can judge me. And I don't believe for a second that Daniel lived this life thinking that, oh, no one can judge me, a sort of arrogant cop-out sort of um, retort. Um, I strongly believe that Daniel knew that truly God was the was the one and true living God and God was truly um, his, his fortress, God was truly his judge and Daniel lived his life to God's standard and Daniel knew that for as long as he was connected to God in prayer, as long as he knew that he was doing things and living a life of excellence through the spirit of God working in and through him, only God could judge what was going on. And it's important that we live our lives understanding that God is our judge. And when situations and circumstances are challenging, and when we're looking to, in fact, get justice, uh, we have to wait for God's, uh, God's um, timing, and God will vindicate us in due season. And so we have the testimonials. Um, I said at the beginning that actually, um, we had, um, Daniel actually went through three kings. So um, when you look at the book of Daniel, um, it started off with King Nebuchadnezzar. And then actually um, King Nebuchadnezzar's son, um, Belshazzar, uh, was also um, in power. And <clears throat> the story, the well-known story of uh, the writing on the wall and Daniel had to interpret the, the, the dream. And then also in chapter six, where we see now with King Darius, and uh, Daniel showed himself um, faithful. We get to situations where whatever their agenda was <clears throat> and whatever they had set out to do, God was truly gonna get his glory anyway. And so it took for Daniel to be transported from Jerusalem to Babylon. And you might wonder why on earth would God do that? Why would God place him there? And Daniel was but a teenager. But we can see that in the end, through all the uh, situations that was going on, that Daniel was placed in Babylon. Whoever was in charge, whether it was King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, or whether it was King Darius, wherever they tried to place him, whether they put them in a fiery furnace, or whether they were in the lion's den, God's hand was upon them, and God was truly gonna get his glory. And so we see the testimonials from King Nebuchadnezzar so after um, Sadrach, Meshach and Abednego went in the fiery furnace, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar had to say with his own mouth, so praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make this degree, decree, if any people whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb and the houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. And what a beautiful testimonial of God's goodness that actually when people saw the life of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, King Nebuchadnezzar had to testify exactly what had happened, that they were willing to die than worship any other God. He says, and he recognized the power of God to send angels to rescue his servants. And he had to say with his own mouth that anyone who speaks just a word against them will be turned from limb from limb. What a beautiful testament of God's goodness. Then we have King Darius. So we saw in chapter six where Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. It says, then the King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs mir miraculous signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And again, we can see um, God being glorified once again through a king 
who had his own agenda, uh, who, um, yeah, basically thought he had his agenda, um, but God had the final say. And what a beautiful testimony and what a challenge it is for us to live our lives in such a way that kings and leaders will testify to the glory of God. And so the challenge then becomes, in the settings that we're in, what is it gonna take for people to see God's glory shining through you? And I wanna end by talking about the call to excellence. And the first thing I wanna encourage us and I've said it before and I'll say it again, is that we embrace what God is doing in and through us and we embrace where God has placed us. Again, I really want to encourage you that God has gifted you with a, a special gift and, and an anointing and God wants to see you uh, uh, grow um, into the knowledge of who he is and, and grow deeper in your faith. And so it's not about looking to the left or to the right about what God's doing through other people, what, but what is God doing through you? We're a church, we're a body, and the body has many parts. And it's so important that we embrace what God has called you to do. Secondly, there's no place to hide. The call to excellence means that we need to um, be a light. We need to be open, we need to be seen. Thirdly, we need to do what we're doing for Christ and do it well. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. Now I'll read Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. It's a call to excellence. It says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, then give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And I think there's each and every one of us, there's no one on this, uh, no one on this uh, uh, Zoom uh, session that God hasn't called. God has called and God has a purpose for each and every one of our lives. And it's about identifying what has God called you to do and how are you going to do it in excellence? There's a call to do what we do and to do it well. Just want to remind us that, uh, that excellence means that we, we are used for God's vessels for his glory. Excellence means we are vessels for God's glory and not for showcasing our own vanity. And so if someone feels that, oh, you're, you're a great speaker, it's to the glory of God. And I use it to the glory of God. I'm not puffed up. I'm not arrogant to think that no one else can speak or no one else can speak as good as me. And I'm in competition with my brother or sister or I'm a prayer warrior. So no one else can pray. No, I'm not here to showcase my vanity. I'm not here to showcase uh, me as a, as, a, as a public figure, as Tunde the, the, Tunde the Great. God has to be glorified. And I'm to be used as a vessel of honour for God's glory. We're not here to be showcasing people and showcasing our vanity. And so I want to encourage us as Micah. And um, one of the things I love about this church is we have so many different and gifted people in so many different ways. And whether we realise it or not, God has blessed us with so many people in a variety of ways, whether it's the gift of serving, the gift of prayer, people who uh, have a love for business, people who are in, in media, people who are in um, the square mile. We have so many people, people who are teachers, you know, so many people God has gifted us with. Um, people are great at social media. It's absolutely amazing. And, and it's about us identifying what God has called us to do and doing it well. I, I'll finish on this. Um, I, I was reminiscing on um, uh, the times when we've been back at church and, you know, I'd be doing set up and breakdown and, you know, it, it used to um, bring, bring a smile to my face knowing that just in one morning um, I'll be blessed by some of the gifts 
um, God has blessed people with uh, and I'll share what I mean so I remember the times when I it would be a Saturday evening and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll remember I've got to wake up in the morning to do set up and break down and when I walk through the doors and sometimes I'll be tired I'll admit I'm tired and shattered and I'm like oh, what am I doing here and uh, there was nothing better than walking in and, and seeing a brother of encouragement and, and, and there's no other brother of encouragement more uh, passionate than Phil Brown Phil Brown if you're on God bless you and I don't know if you've ever walked in and it will be hello Tundi how you doing it's my best Phil Brown impression how you doing Tundi you know what I can see you're a little bit man but you know what God has got you and God will never give you more than you can bear be encouraged brother I know what it's like I know what it's like but trust me God's got you God bless you brother and even just that there, that word of encouragement for two seconds is absolutely life-changing. That God's called him to be a brother of encouragement and he does it well. God bless you, Phil. Those mornings when I felt so discouraged, seeing you and hearing you encourage me always brought me so much great joy. Then I walk down to the corridor uh, and I'll, uh, I'll walk around the corner. And five minutes later, Auntie Dorrit, and the prayer warrior teams will come. And uh, those that know Auntie Dorrit, she's a, a woman of prayer. And God bless you, Auntie Dorrit. For many years, I've been blessed and seen God's glory shine through you. And all Auntie Dorrit needed to do was just literally tap me on the shoulder and say, God bless you, brother. God is in control. Trust him. God is in control. Job done. And for years, some of those sentences have just kept me and I knew God was speaking through her and even just knowing that week after week, month after month, year after year, you knew that the service and the people that met met to give the service over to God and all the great times we've had in God uh, at Micah, you know that there's been an engine room and all the other prayer warriors Auntie Dorrit and Mum Nita and the rest of them, Auntie Lena, God bless her soul. Thank you for really showing us what excellence is, being consistent in the prayer room, being committed and using your um, your gifts as vessels that God's glory will show, cut, show shining through you as vessels for his glory. And then I'll, I'll also uh, end with, with a brother who has got such a gift for, for, for giving such a gift for uh, um, serving and uh, after I've got the encouraging word from Auntie Dora or uh, uh, Brother Phil I'll go upstairs and uh, I'll be visited by Tony Cowens and uh, Tony is Mr. Get the job done <laughs> and so Tony's dialogue will be Hi Ton, how's it going mate? You right? How's Tiggy? Yep, fine, how's Ruben? Good Right, it's quarter past nine the chairs and the benches need to go out. It's quarter past nine. Let's see if we can get stuff done by 10.30, eh? We may even get a word of prayer. Brilliant. <laughs> I was told me it was, get the job done. Yeah, uh, no talking, get on with it. But Tony's heart's to serve. In 10 years, in 12 years, has there ever been a time when you go with the first person you see and the last person to leave? Who's it been? We thank God for your level of excellence, Tony that God's glory has shined through you, through serving. And there's so many other unsung heroes uh, through Micah. We thank God for your lives. So many others I could mention. Unsung heroes, some of you that have been on the door. God bless you. Thank God for you. And so guys, we're blessed. I want to end in saying that we're a blessed congregation. I thank God for the gifts and talents that God's given each and every one of us. And as I said, some of us may find ourselves in difficult situations, but God wants to get the glory through your gifting. Those of you who are blessed in business, God bless you. Those of you who've got a heart and passion for the youth, God bless you. Those of you who teach young children, God bless you. Those of you who, who serve and do catering, God bless you. Those of you who are blessed with cooking, like my wife, God bless you. And I'll even, yeah, I'll give a shout to my wife. Um, the years I've seen her passionately uh, um, <clears throat> take her gift of cooking seriously. Some of you may not know, 
I remember the times when we were in our one bedroom flat in Gypsy Hill and we'll sit, she'll sit by the radiator and say, you know what, babe? I really think God will come bless us with a, a place where we can cook and host people and people can come together and, and, and really fellowship together and grow deeper in God. And seven, eight years later, here we are now. There was a passion that she had from within and she took it seriously. So that meant spending two and a half hours in Sainsbury's looking at all these ingredients. It, it took going to this restaurant, that restaurant, to, to brush up on her recipes. But the end goal was that she wanted God to be glorified through her cooking. And she took it seriously and she was consistent and passionate about it. I could go on and there's many more people who are passionate. God bless you, Kareem. You're passionate about, about who we are, our identity. God bless you. See you many others so we bless you guys and um, we're gonna bow our heads to pray father god i thank you and we bless you today for who you are thank you lord god that you are true a living god and we glorify you we see your your greatness we see your beauty in creation we see your greatness in all that we see and everything that we see that is excellent we know it comes from you and father god i thank you for each and every brother and sister on this call I thank you, Lord, that you've unique, uniquely designed them and, and, and called them at such a time as this to be called and to be used for your glory, to showcase your goodness, your greatness. And Father God, I pray, Lord, that even as they um, continually um, search and use their giftings to glorify your name, I pray, Father God, that your spirit will indwell in them to do it so that they, everything they do is done with excellence. I pray, Lord, that the spirit of excellence will reign and shine through in my cup. I pray, Lord, that we'll be a shining light, a beacon in our communities, in our surroundings, our places of work, in our families, in our homes. We'll be a shining beacon for your glory. Lord, that what you've purposed in our hearts to serve you with, Father, we'll do it diligently, we'll be consistent, Father God, and um, what the plans and purposes you have will be um, fulfilled in our lives. I pray, Father God, of the testimonies, I speak speaking to the testimonies that will come from people's mouths, that when they see the evidence of our lives, they'll truly say that, yes, truly, the, gods that we, the God that we serve is a true and living God, just like King Nebuchadnezzar did and just like King Darius did. I pray in faith, Father Lord, that, that we'll be leaders in our community that you've called us to be. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to the message today. We hope it blessed you. And if it did, please like, comment and subscribe for more videos from Micah. And don't forget to click the notification bell to see when they're uploaded. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one.